What a great song, huh? What a great song that echoes our heart sentiments tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that is exactly what we want to do is run into your arms and we want to stay there. Our soul needs a friend. Our heart needs a surgeon, Lord. And we just pray that tonight your spirit would have your way in your church. And Lord, um, we, we want to tell you that we just love you so much. And we are so thankful for the sacrifice that you gave. And Lord, may we not take it lightly or take it for granted, but Lord, may it truly sink down into our hearts and, and become, become our identity, Lord, and that we would live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Grab your Bibles. Open them um, to 1 Samuel this evening. 1 Samuel. While you're turning there, um, we've kind of been having this ongoing discussion about some things in the church. And I want to say thanks to everybody that um, shot me an email or, or wrote me a note and just let me know. I really appreciate it. I really do. And um, I'm thankful that you guys um, can share your opinions with me at nicely, most of you nicely. And some of you need to learn a little, take a little class on that. But, but, but I got the point. No, I'm kidding. And, um, you know, I, I was also speaking about the are, are talking with this um, with a few a few people as well that know about these kinds of things and and uh, they were they were saying it would that just because we painted the wall black or whatever doesn't mean that we couldn't have that dark cross still hanging there and I was like wow great thank you for sharing that so anyways I'm totally caving here we're gonna put the cross back up so no. <laughs> just. I'm just kidding. I'm not caving. I really do think that's the best thing, guys. And uh, I do want to thank you guys for sharing with me. I'm just thankful for all your guys' input on that and appreciate it. So um, if you didn't like it there, then I guess you can write me an email now. So <laughs> I'm just here from everybody. It's great. No, but I really do thank you guys, and, and, and I love you guys, and I'm thankful that we can, we can um, you know, share with each other. So Tonight, we're, we're deviating a little bit. Before I get into the study, though, I did, I did want to say this. I've been asked several times, Pastor Phil, when we come to church on Sunday, do we have to wear masks? And so all these people are, are asking me that question. And this is what I wanted to share with you, the verse that the Lord has put on my heart. Um, so this is my unofficial response um, from the Word of God, though. It says in John chapter 6 and in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. So if you come to church to see Jesus and to meet with Jesus, I don't care how you come. If you come with a mask on, great. If you come without a mask on, I'm not going to stop you from coming to meet with Jesus. Um, Jesus isn't going to cast us out. Um, I'm not going to either. So, yeah. Now, if they somehow pass a law, then that's your fault. And I'm not going to back you up on that, so we'll probably have to obey the law if it becomes a law. Oh, my wife just texted me and said, don't smack your lips, LOL. I can't believe she just did that. I'm sorry. I'm getting way too transparent up here. Okay. Well, tonight, I just really sense from the Lord, um, and I don't want to get in, in the Lord's way, so... Uh, I would have normally taught from Isaiah tonight, um, but just really since the Lord wanted me to share something different with you guys tonight, so we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 17 tonight instead of in Isaiah, and I pray that the Lord will, will use this message for such a time as this in our lives um, as we're living in this time when we need men and women of courage men and women that are willing to step up and fight against the giants. And uh, we are facing a lot of them these days. And so it really does feel like a David and Goliath type of a situation. So it's a David and Goliath type night with a David and Goliath type message. And let's pray and ask the Lord to please speak to us through this time. Heavenly Father, I just pray that uh, we would decrease and that you would increase. I pray, Lord, that as your word is shared, that your Holy Spirit would move and, and connect our hearts to yours. And Lord, I just pray that as the word of God goes forth, that you would 
you would accomplish the purpose for which you have um, sowed that word tonight. And Lord, um, I just want to pray that the fruit of our time in the word would not be fleshly, but that it would be spirit-filled and that we would see fruit of the Holy Spirit through, through this time. And Lord, we just thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, one other thing I do need to say as well. Next Wednesday night, we, we have a special event here for Amir Sarfati. As you guys all know, that is going to be uh, uh, ho hopefully a very full event. So if you know that you're not coming uh, and you have tickets for that, please turn those tickets in uh, as soon as you can to the front office. And we'll get those to uh, folks that, that we know are waiting. Okay? And so I'd appreciate that very much. And then next Wednesday night will be Amir Sarfati. I'm very excited about that. Looking forward to it. Tonight I'd like to begin by reading 1 Samuel 17, verses 40 through 48. So let's read the text together. Or, I mean, I'll read it to you guys. You follow along. It says, Then he, David, took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And, and I, I want to pause right there for a moment because I actually have a pouch right here. And in my pouch, I have four stones because I went to the Valley of Elah and I, I was looking around for the rocks that David used and I could only find four. So I picked them up and I brought, these are actually from Israel right here. They weren't the only rocks in the valley, though, by the way. I, I think they actually have dump trucks that pull in there and drop gravel. But I have four rocks from the Valley of Elah. If anybody wants to see those tonight, they're in this little red pouch. You can come and see them afterwards. Um, but, and there's only four of them because David, the other one, I assume, is in Goliath's head still. So, <laughs> Verse 4, and he, I'm sorry, verse 41. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field." Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. We'll, we'll read 49 and 52. It says, Then David put his hand in this, his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine, and killed him, and there was no sword in the hand of David. I want to pray one more time. Lord, we pray that as we, as we uh, look at this passage tonight, and as I share what you've put on my heart, I pray that this would be an edifying time, and, and a time that you speak, and work, and move. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, I love these verses that we've read tonight in, in the Bible. In fact, in the margin of my Bible, I've written the words, Warrior's Creed. Warrior's Creed, because I really think that you see the heart of a warrior in David's life right here. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's something that m motivates me. It stirs me. It causes me to uh, want to 
be this kind of a man who, when he sees the enemy coming and advancing, doesn't look for a place to hide, but rather steps forward with whatever God has provided him with and says, God, use me for your glory. I'm your man. This is an awe-inspiring uh, example for us. And it moves my heart to see someone who's confident, not in himself, but in the Lord. I love to see these kind of uh, uh, stories in the Bible where people's faith becomes real life. Where you see a real life situation where David didn't have any other choice but then to trust in God. And he had to look to the Lord and say, God, if you're not with me, I'm done. I'm through. I've got nothing to, to combat this <laughs> towering giant. My heart is to be like this man, this David, who's after God's own heart. The Bible tells us. That's how he's described. He's a man after God's own heart. And, and that's who I want to be, and I hope that's who you want to be as well, who knows God, trusts God, and answers God's call to stand for him. Let me paint a picture for you of what these verses in the scripture were like. Down in the valley of Elah, in full battle array, you've got the Philistine army there. And then <clears throat> across from them on the other hill, you have the, the army of Israel. I'm sorry, the Philistines on one hill, Israel on the other hill. And then no battle taking place. Why not? Why no warfare? Well, because there, there was fear. The, the army of Israel was immobilized by fear. The fear of the representative of the forces of darkness that stood in the valley and was issuing a challenge. And in this passage of Scripture for us, the representative is Goliath. His name means exile. I find it interesting that Satan is exactly that. He's an exile from heaven. He's an exile from the courts of our God for eternity. Goliath is really a fascinating representative of our enemy, the enemy of our soul. As he walked to and fro in the valley before Israel that day, issuing threats and challenges to the people of God. You see, Goliath was six feet tall, or nine feet, six inches tall. Nine feet, six inches tall. And we had a basketball player here on Sunday that was six feet 11. And he was huge. I was like, wow. I didn't know God made him that big. <laughs> this guy would have dwarfed him. Goliath is nine feet, six inches tall. The champion of the Philistine army. And he was intimidating. He was decked out in bronze armor, shining in the sun. His armor alone, we're told, weighs about 125 pounds. The tip of his spear alone, we're told, was 15 pounds. I got a 10-pound weight right here. I want to drop this, see what happens. That's 10 pounds. His shield or his spear was 15 pounds. Can you imagine that piercing your chest, just crushing the bones of your chest as it goes into your body? He was an intimidating warrior. And that is why the people of Israel were trembling in their boots. Rightfully so, because no human being in his own strength can match up against the enemy of our soul. Now, enter David, the sheep herder. <laughs> the Bible describes him as being a youth, ruddy and good looking. <laughs> that word ruddy is kind of interesting. It means that he either had a lot of zits or that he just had a boyish appearance. Take your pick. I hope for David's sake, it wasn't the zits, you know. I hope it was just that he was a young looking guy, you know. But David's name means well beloved. And for us tonight, I want to see that David is a picture of two things, really. First, he's a picture of a man who's after God's own heart. And second, he's a picture of the man who's answering God's call to stand up, to do something. 
in the face of the adversity and the intimidation and the threats and the fear. And I want to talk tonight about how we as men and women of God are called to answer God's call as well. To, to stand up for what is right in our world. And even if it means that we go down, we still stand for the Lord. Whether we stand or fall, it's for his glory. And, and guys, we have to realize that we are like David. We, in the church, the, the, the Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church of today, we, we don't, we're not living in uh, uh, the time of Christianity. We're living in the post or post postmodern world. And so the ideas of our culture and the way our culture operates and thinks, it's totally different than it was a generation or even two generations ago. I'm sorry, two generations or even one generation ago. But what is God's call? Well, to understand God's call in our lives, we need to understand, first of all, the greatest command of the Bible. What is the greatest command of the Bible? It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. And I'm going to read that for you. The verses will be on your screen. We're going to be in several scriptures, so I don't want to uh, um, tire you out. But if you can get there, get there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. The word says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That sounds a lot like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, I believe it is, where he echoes the greatest command. The greatest command is to love God with all our lives. This is what you are called to do. This is why you've been created. And we cannot follow God's greatest command until, get this, you are unable, you are absolutely incapable of following God's greatest command until you accept his greatest invitation. The greatest invitation ever given to man comes from Jesus Christ himself. He tells us in Luke 9, 23 and 24, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, I love that word, anyone, because <laughs> I'm an anyone. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He reflects the heart of God when in Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, God said, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that doesn't give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. That's God's great invitation. He says at the end of the book that we're studying tonight in Revelation twenty two seventeen, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Wow. I hope you can hear the heart of God, the invitation he's given to you and me and anyone, whoever desires to follow him. He longs for men and women to answer his call. This is an invitation. It's not just a once-in-a-lifetime invitation. Jesus invites you every single day. Jesus invites you every single day to respond to him, to love him, and to walk with him. But I want to call your attention to another way that I believe that God is calling us today. 
Remember what we started with. For David, answering God's call meant stepping up to the challenge to face Goliath. Well, that's another thing that I believe that God is calling you and I to do today. He's calling us to answer the challenge of the enemy, to face the enemy in our lives. David stepped up to do what no one else was willing to do. All the rest of the army was looking for rocks and trees to hide behind. They were trying to scramble over the horizon so they didn't have to face that giant, intimidating, threatening, yelling, blaspheming God. They were passing the buck for someone else. But David showed up, simple shepherd boy. David showed up, he was taking care of the sheep, bringing some supplies to his brothers. He shows up, he sees what's going on, and his heart is stirred, and he doesn't back away. He says, Lord, what can I do? He knew the Lord his God was greater than the giant. Now, speaking of giants tonight, what are the giants in your life? What are the obstacles, the threats, the intimidating things, the the things that are tripping you up and holding you back from standing up and answering God's call. The truth is we all face giants, every single one of us. If we're honest, we all have something that we're facing in our lives that's holding us back, something that's keeping us from answering God's call to stand. Sometimes it can be idolatry. Idolatry is simply that worship of anything or anyone over God. You're putting someone or something in God's place, his rightful place. And you're letting that dictate your life. You're letting it control you. For some, that might be drugs, whether that's painkillers, antidepressants, or you just like to party. And that's coming between you and God's call in your life. For some, it might be alcohol. For others, it could be work. It could be money. You're looking at the bank account and the bottom line, and that's all you're worried about. That's dictating your life, and you are not answering God's call because that is what comes first in your heart. i never forget the story of a young <clears throat> high school kid that came to, to, to his youth pastor, or the parents came to the youth pastor about this young high school kid, and they said, we don't know what's wrong with this guy. He, he doesn't want to come to church. He's rebellious. He acts like he doesn't want anything to do with the church. And, 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 and it, it's just, he acts like it's not important to him. So the youth pastor sat down with this high schooler and tried to get him to talk and the high school kid would not open up. He didn't want to speak about what was going on. And as much as the youth pastor was asking him questions, what about this, what about that, he couldn't get this kid to open up. And so he said, you know what, I'm just going to, I think we need to meet again at a different time. Maybe in different circumstances, you can, you'll, you'll open up and share what's going on in your heart, why you don't like coming to church, why you, don't think, why you think it's a waste of time, why it's not important to you. And so the youth pastor brought the brought that, that son back out to his dad. And his dad jumped on his case right in front of that youth pastor. What's wrong with you? Why won't you open up and talk to the pastor? You, you're worthless. Talking to him in, a, in a, just a degrading tone and just really talking down, disrespecting him. And sure enough, the youth pastor understands where, where's the disconnect there? We, we understand. You can't treat your kids like that and expect them to follow your example and go to church where you're being a hypocrite and acting like you love God and yet you're treating your son like that, right? We can't, we can't be like that. Sometimes wives or husbands can become an idol. Sometimes kids can become an idol, especially for moms, Right? Moms can put their kids before the Lord. Oh, it's all about my kids and their happiness and whatever they want. And we can make them an idol in our lives. Those are giants. Those, that, that, that giant of idolatry that can come between us and the call that God is placing. What about blasphemy? Straight up rejecting Christ. That is a giant that must fall. Because if that giant does not fall, 
then the Bible says that that soul will be condemned to hell. And so we need to be praying against the spirit that rejects Jesus Christ, praying and asking God to intervene, and we need to be lobbying the artillery of prayer for the souls that are not saved in our lives. There's the giant of disobedience. We know what's right, but we continually go the other way. Why? Because we're too lazy to train. Yeah, the answer is not just saying, no, I'm not going to do that. No, the answer is getting in the word, memorizing scripture, growing as a Christian, training in your spiritual life like a soldier trains for the battlefield, taking this seriously. Not living in disobedience just because that's the easy way out. There's the giant of unbelief. It's not shown by your words, but by your works. You say you believe, but you live like God is a teeny little, you know, God who doesn't have the power to overcome. We have the giant of ignorance in our lives where Christians are choosing not to learn. Christians are choosing not to study. They're saying, no, I'm going to put my life above and beyond my life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That word disciple means learner, and it's a lifelong learning process. Some Christians are just not willing to study, to grow, to learn. Others have the giant of pride separating them from the call of God in their lives. They're so prideful. The focus is so on themselves that you, they're not teachable. They're not able to be used by God because of the giant of pride in their hearts and lives. There's the giant of unforgiveness. Every time a memory comes into your mind, you're filled with this bitterness and anger and hatred. And that unforgiveness is a giant that's keeping you from answering God's call in your life. Hey, listen, I get it that we're going to get hurt in this life. We live in a world that's filled with sinful people. And sinful people do sinful things that hurt. And, and when we see it happen in other people's lives, it's one thing. But when it happens to us, well, that's unforgivable. But the key to all of this is God. Surrender to him, bringing our hearts to him, understanding he has the power to forgive. The memory will remain, of course, but the bitterness, the anger, the hatred, it can heal because God can work and move in your heart. The key to remembering that is how much has God forgiven you? How much has God forgiven you? And I'm not belittling what has happened to you, to anyone here tonight. I understand that there are serious wrongs that can be done. But there's nothing that is too difficult for God. There's the giant of lying, gossip, or stealing. These could be giants in people's lives that they are constantly falling into and not able to overcome, and they're not answering God's call because they're living this lifestyle. There's the lifestyle of coveting and lust. Refusing to be satisfied with what God has blessed you with. I want to read to you tonight from an excerpt of an email update that I received from this organization. It's called the Freedom Fight. It's for men that uh, in the battle for purity want accountability in their lives. And this, this particular email said that Pornhub is the largest pornography website in the world. And in 2018, they had 33.5 billion visits. As you can see, the U.S. is by far the biggest consumer of porn, responsible for watching a fourth of all the porn in the world. That would be over 8 billion visits for Americans in 2018 alone. That's enough for 25 visits for every man, woman, and child in America, and that's only one website out of tens of thousands. The amount of pornography being consumed in America is mind-boggling. They go on to say that we live in a world where it's easier for a 12-year-old to access pornography than to get up and get a drink of water from the sink because... To get a drink of water, they actually have to get up and walk around. That's not just a man's problem either. 
29% of all porn consumed is consumed by women, and women that are 13 to 24 are much more likely to watch it than those that are 25 and older. This issue, guys, alone is one of the greatest giants that the church is being crippled by today. And we don't want to talk about it here because we're going to heap shame on somebody. I'm sorry, but that's not the way the church should be. We should be, we sh this should be the place where we can talk about these things, where a brother can come alongside of another older brother in the Lord and say, hey, can you help me with this and pray for me and show me what to do? Can you give me some scripture verses to memorize and then come alongside of me and walk me through this? Because I'm struggling. The church should be the place where we can do that. Instead of casting shame upon someone to the point that no one wants to open their mouth about sin, even though we know we're all having sin issues. The church, man, the, it saddens me when I hear that young men are more afraid to talk about their problems in the church than they are to unburden themselves to their fellow football players or their friends at school or people that they have barely even known on the street. Why? Because they don't get shamed by those people. But when they come to church, suddenly it's a different story. Man, we of all people should understand the grace of God and I think we need to overcome this giant by dealing with it. It's going to happen on a one-to-one -one level, guys. And if that's something that's in your life, please, let's bring it to the surface. Let's put it in the light and walk in the light as he is in the light. We need one another to overcome this so that we can have a powerful witness in the world. There's also the giant of laziness. Laziness is simply not caring that God has entrusted you to be a steward of the good news. All of those are examples of giants that we're facing today. What's the solution? The Word of God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you want to flip over there, Deuteronomy chapter 7. The verses will be up on the screen as well. But in case you want to read it in your own Bible, Deuteronomy 7, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Deuteronomy 7, 1 says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when, they, or when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them, nor shall you give your son to their son, or your daughter to their son, nor shall you take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But this, <clears throat> thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars. You cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. What's the answer to defeating these giants? We need to come out from among them and be separate. We need to recognize that we are called by God. We need to stop trying to fight these battles in the flesh. Goliath was a nine foot six giant with bronze armor, a sword, a spear, a shield, all of the modern technology on display, right? And there's David, the little shepherd boy, coming out with a staff and a sling and five little stones from the brook. What was God doing through this? He was showing us that it's through the power of God that deliverance comes. Not the philosophies and the logic and the, 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 the intelligence of man. It comes through prayer. It comes through the spirit. It comes through God working in our lives. We need men and women who are going to answer the call of God who are going to stand up to the giants, first in our own lives and then in our world around us. 
The enemy is mocking. He's threatening. He's even blaspheming us. The mighty name of our God. What are we going to do about it? Because we all have a choice. We can sit back. We can take it easy. We can hope that someone else takes the charge. We can hope that someone else steps up. We can hope that someone else defeats the giant. Or we can do this. Romans 13 tells us we can, knowing the time, we can do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the lusts or for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You see, God is going to defeat his enemies. Our choice is to join him and be a part of his victory, that victory that he has already claimed, or we can shrink back. We can shrink back and continue to struggle and continue not to be having power in our witness and, and not able to stand for the Lord in a dark time when the world around us needs to see somebody who loves God. We can choose to set our minds, our hearts on the one who's greater than all of our sin, greater than death, greater than even Goliath with all of his threats and blasphemies. God is greater than your obstacle. God is greater than your giant that you're facing. So whatever it is, my brother, whatever it is, my sister, that's keeping you back, that's holding you back from doing your part and standing for the Lord for what's right. Take it down. Let the Lord win the battle. We, like David, can choose to trust in him above all else. We can choose to give him the first fruit of our hearts. We can choose to come to him in the word and to study and meditate and memorize and overcome. We can choose. He has to provide the power. He has to provide the Holy Spirit. So what is God calling you to do tonight? What is he calling you to overcome? Is there an obstacle, a giant that needs to fall before you can stand for him and answer his call? If so, I pray that you deal with that tonight. I really do. Maybe it's one of those things that we talked about. Maybe it's something totally different, and the Holy Spirit knows exactly what it is, and he's going to put his finger on it tonight. Don't you love how the Holy Spirit just does that? He just knows what we're struggling with. And when we come to him with a sincere heart, he's going to show us this is the giant that needs to fall. This is the obstacle that's blocking you from answering God's call. And some of us just need to realize it's not, it's not going to happen in the work of the flesh. As strong as you might be, as well off as you might be, as intelligent as you might be, you cannot defeat the enemy in your flesh. And so tonight, the Lord has some rocks for you to pick up. He's got a staff that he wants you to open up and get into. He's got a position on your knees that he wants to fill you with his spirit and he wants to work in a mighty way. But you have to get out of his way. You have to die to yourself. You have to let that pride go. And I tell you what, guys, when you do it, the Lord is going to meet you. The Lord is going to meet you. If you don't surrender to him, then overcoming that obstacle is going to be impossible because you can't do it without plugging into his power source, the Holy Spirit. So tonight as we, as we uh, end our service, we're going to do just that. We have some extra time. I want to spend it in worship before the Lord. And 
you know, I, w- I want to open up this altar, the stairs on the side. You can come down, you can kneel, you can pray. You can surrender some things to the Lord that you might need to surrender to the Lord if he's calling you to do that tonight. You could also do that right there in your chairs. You can get down on your knees there at your chair and pour your heart out to the Lord and confess to him right there. Um, and, and you don't even have to get on your knees if that's not a, an option for you. I get that. Just do it there in your chair. It's the Lord knows, the Lord understands, and the Lord sees. And he's here to meet with us tonight. I don't want to get in his way of what he wants to do in our lives tonight, but I know this. I know that he's calling us. I know that he's calling us to say, we're not going to back down from this giant. We're not going to just cower in fear. We're not going to wait until somebody else steps up. No, tonight's the night that you deal with what needs to be dealt with, and we ask God to fill us with his power to do what he wants to do. Let's pray. Lord, we just do... uh, in, in our hearts just want to come before you, acknowledging that we need you so desperately, that, Lord, we, we can't overcome giants in our own flesh. David didn't approach Goliath in his own strength, but he came to him in the name of the Lord of hosts. And, Lord, that is our heart tonight. We want to come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. And we want to ask you to help us, Lord. If there is things that need to be overcome, if there are sins that are dominating lives in this sanctuary tonight, I pray that they would be dealt with. I pray that people would lay them down, that they would confess them to you, that they would put them in the light as you are in the light, and that Satan would no longer be able to hold them captive because of these giants of fear that have held them captive. I pray that people would just respond to your Holy Spirit tonight. And that, Lord, you would have your way in our lives. Because we need you, Lord, in this time. We live in dark days. We live in times when many are trying to control. And, Lord, we know that you're the only one who's ultimately in control. We love you, Lord. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and worship, guys. You can stand. You can uh, kneel. You can come down here to the altar if you would like to do that. Uh, You have freedom uh, to worship the Lord this night as we uh, finish our, our service here.